Hey guys and welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Khalid Maida. In today's video, we're going to be taking you through all you need to know about passive range of movement testing of the elbow joint. And the purpose behind these tests is to analyse what happens to your patient's movement when active contractile structures are not involved. And if you'd like more information behind passive range of movement testing, head on over to our video titled Why Test Passive Range of Movement, which takes you through the full clinical reasoning behind these tests. So as to not slow your video down, we're not going to be comparing the tests on the affected and unaffected sides. But of course, it's vitally important that you do this in practice, so remember that whilst you're watching. And as with all passive range of movement testing, we're going to be considering pain, range, and end feel. So let's get into our main video. Let's get clinical. So now we're going to test Liv's arm in terms of elbow passive range of movement, and we're going to look at particular flexion and extension of the elbow. We're going to start with the positioning of the patient and the therapist, which is the same for elbow flexion as it is for elbow extension. And that position is where the therapist is standing to the side of the patient, so you can accurately measure the degree of movement of the elbow joint. The patient is sitting in a relaxed position. In terms of our handling, one hand is going to be supporting the joint underneath the olecranon, and the other hand is going to be just proximal to the wrist joint, controlling movement of the forearm. So to test flexion passively, we take the patient's elbow from a completely extended position to a completely flexed position. And then we can perform the opposite by taking the elbow into a fully extended position like so. So when we're looking at passive range of movement, we're testing for pain, range and end feel. If you elicit pain with passive range of movement, that tells you that either joint structures have been irritated or soft tissue has been stressed. In terms of elbow flexion and extension, the joint structures that you're looking at in particular are the radiohumeral joint and the ulnohumeral joint. Whereas soft tissue, in a flexed position, the triceps muscles are on a full stretch and in an extended position, the biceps muscles are on a full stretch. So you might get pain because of these reasons. In terms of range of movement, we expect range to be between 0 and 145 for each of them. And in terms of end feel, we expect to have a soft end feel for flexion. This may change if your patient has a condition such as osteoarthritis, where the uh, end feel may be more hard due to things like osteophyte formation. In terms of extension, we expect to find a hard end feel on range of movement. However, if your patient's elbow is hypermobile, like we have with our model here, you may find that the end feel is more spongy or elastic in nature. So now we're going to look at passive range of movement of the elbow in terms of supination and pronation. The positioning of the therapist and the patient is the same for supination as it is for pronation. And that's going to be with the therapist standing directly in front of the patient so you can accurately measure the movement occurring at the joint. The patient is sitting so that they're relaxed. In terms of handling, one hand is going to be underneath the elbow joint to provide support. And the other hand is going to be just proximal to the wrist joint so you can control movement of the forearm. In terms of this video, you'll see me performing these movements with the elbow over here. Whereas in actual practice, you may want to do these movements with the elbow tucked in next to the ribs so that the shoulder is in a completely neutral position. As I said, for this video, we're not going to do that so you can see what's occurring in the elbow. So now we're going to measure supination. To do this movement, we start with the patient's wrist in a neutral position like so, so that the thumb is facing the ceiling. We then use our uppermost hand to move the forearm laterally so that the patient is in supination as if they were holding a bowl of soup. We're then going to take their forearm medially to achieve full pronation. So during the movement, we're going to look at pain, range and end feel. In terms of pain, if we elicit pain with passive range of movement, that can tell you that either joint structures are being irritated or soft tissue is being stressed. In particular, supination and pronation look at the superior radio ulna joint. So you can tell that any, any irritation of the joint is occurring here. Also, supination and pronation is where you have full rotation of the radial head. So this is the other joint structure that can be affected. 
in terms of soft tissue, when we have the elbow in a fully supinated position, this is where the wrist flexor muscles are being stretched. Whereas in a pronated position, this is where the wrist extensor muscles are being stretched. So pain in either of those areas may be due to muscles being stretched. Normal range of movement for supination is 85 degrees, whereas normal range of movement for pronation is 70 degrees. In terms of end feel, we expect end feel of supination to be elastic in nature, whereas for pronation, end feel is expected to be hard in nature. So here are some key points to summarise the video on passive range of movement of the elbow joint. Complete your assess of a passive range of movement by looking at flexion, extension, supination and pronation of the elbow. Note the position of the patient and the therapist with each movement, as well as the handling used by the therapist. Make sure you compare both affected and unaffected sides, and when testing passive range of movement, make a note of pain, range and end feel for each movement. And that completes our video on passive range of movement testing of the elbow joint. In practice, you would now compare your patient's passive range of movement with their active range of movement. And by doing so will allow you to make a decision as to whether it's most likely to be contractile or non-contractile structures which are at fault for their condition. This, as well as your other tests, will help you clarify their diagnosis. If you're not quite sure on how to interpret the differences, have a look at our videos titled Why Test Passive Range of Movement and Why Test Active Range of Movement. And then join us back again for the next video here on Clinical Physio. Thank you so much for watching as always, and we'll see you again soon.